From cosmology, we know that in every hour we travel in excess of 1,665,000 miles. How do we do that? It's like we live on a spacecraft, within a spacecraft, within yet another spacecraft at least. The first spacecraft is planet Earth. As we sit here, we travel around a star we call the sun at 65,000 miles an hour. At the same time, our solar system, in which we're also a passenger, is orbiting the Milky Way galaxy at 600,000 miles an hour. And also at the same time, our galaxy, in which we're also a passenger, is traveling outward among other galaxies at speeds in excess of a million miles an hour. And for all we know, our universe may be traveling among other universes in what we call a multiverse. We live in something called a solar system. What's a solar system? Solar means sun. The sun is a star. We live in a star system. We have a star, nine planets, 169 moons, and we're always discovering more moons, 30,000 asteroids, countless comets and meteoroids. We live in one of the so-called inner planets. There are four inner planets and five outer planets. The inner planets are Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, also known as the terrestrial planets because they're made up of rock and metal. We live on the third planet from the sun. Then we have the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. As we orbit the sun at 65,000 miles an hour, our planet is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. It's 24,000 miles in circumference, so it takes 24 hours to spin one time. We call that a day. As we're spinning at 1,000 miles an hour and orbiting at 65,000 miles an hour, our moon, 238,857 miles from us, orbits us every 27 days, 7 hours, and 43 minutes. While all this is going on, we're located 93 million miles from the sun. This trip that we take around the sun, traveling at 65,000 miles an hour, is a 600 million mile circuit. Traveling at 65,000 miles an hour, it takes us a year to do this 600 million mile circuit. While all this is going on, our solar system, like a self-contained space station, some seven billion miles in diameter is orbiting the Milky Way galaxy at 600,000 miles an hour. Now imagine that. Then we have 30,000 asteroids, comets, countless comets and meteoroids, and then the whole thing, like a three-ring circus more than 7 billion miles in diameter, is orbiting the Milky Way galaxy at 600,000 miles an hour. Well, how long does it take for our solar system to orbit the Milky Way galaxy once traveling at that speed, 600,000 miles an hour? Recall that we orbit the sun at 65,000 miles an hour and it takes us a year. Now our solar system is orbiting the galaxy at 600,000 miles. Do you think it takes more than a year or less than a year to orbit the Milky Way galaxy one time? It takes more than a year. It takes 225 million years for our solar system to orbit the Milky Way galaxy one time. And you think to yourself, well, that's incredible. How big is the Milky Way galaxy? First of all, the Milky Way galaxy has about 300 billion stars. The one closest to us is actually a grouping of three stars. Two of them Alpha and Beta Centauri tumble over each other, and the third one, Proxima Centauri, orbits those two. Let's say we take a trip from our solar system to this nearest star, Proxima Centauri, and we travel at the speed of light. How fast is that? The speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. How fast is that? In one second, by the time we say 1001, we can travel around our world, planet Earth, more than seven times. Traveling at that speed to get to this nearest star in the Milky Way galaxy, the nearest star of some 300 billion stars, it would take us four years and three months. If we traveled at the speed of our space shuttle, it would take us 155,000 years. The next nearest star after these first three is Cyrus. Traveling at the speed of light to get to Cyrus would take us eight years. 
and nine months. At the speed of our space shuttle, it would take us 350,000 years. So you say, that's incredible. How big is the Milky Way galaxy? The Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years wide. Let's say we're going to take a hike from one end of the galaxy to the other end of the galaxy. And we're going to hike at 186,000 miles a second, the speed of light. We'd have to hike at that speed, 186,000 miles a second, for every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, for 100,000 years. The Milky Way galaxy is huge. In the uh, 1920s, very recently, we thought the Milky Way galaxy was the entire universe. That's an error equivalent to thinking that the Earth is flat. For the Milky Way galaxy is one of 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Why do we say the observable universe? It's because we exist on one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. When we look out, we see dust, gases, billions of stars. It's estimated there may be a trillion galaxies. The nearest large galaxy is Andromeda. There are some smaller ones like the Magellanic Clouds, but the nearest large galaxy is Andromeda. Let's say we want to take a trip to this nearest large galaxy from the Milky Way traveling at that same speed, 186,000 miles a second, would take us 2,200,000 years to get to the nearest galaxy of perhaps a trillion galaxies. And all of these galaxies are traveling outward from each other at speeds in excess of a million miles an hour. This is the incredible system in which we exist and in which we are a tiny fragment, a mere speck on the blueprint of existence. Let's come down to the Earth and consider how long this planet's been here, how long life's been here, how long we've been here, and what life's been through to get this far. From radiometric dating, which is the rate of radioactive decay is constant over time, we know this planet's been here for 4.56 billion years in a universe that's been here for 13.7 billion years. From the fossil record, we know that life began 800 million years after that. That was about 3.8 billion years ago. What form of life? Primitive, single-cell microorganisms. It took more than 3 billion years to go from single-cell, primitive, single-cell microorganisms to multicellular plants and animals. That happened about 670 million years ago. 520 million years ago, the age of vertebrates and invertebrates began. It lasted about 320 million years. It gave us insects, the beginning of fish, and the beginning of reptiles. About 200 million years ago, the age of reptiles began. It lasted about 130 million years. It was the time the dinosaurs lived. About 70 million years ago, mammals began to appear and mark the beginning of the age we live in today, the age of mammals. Mammals are species that feed their young from mammary glands. We're one of 4,400 species of mammals. A significant thing happened at this time. Whereas reptiles hatched from eggs and had to fight their way into the world, we ended up with the reptilian brain. With mammals holding their young close to their bodies for extended periods of time, the brain started to evolve from the reptilian brain to the limbic section of the brain to the neocortex, and a new way of relating began. Mammals showed up about 70 million years ago. We're a mammal. When did we show up? It's thought that the succession of species that gave rise to us separated from the succession of species that led to the apes about five to six million years ago. 
from a common ancestor, the apes moved off in one direction, and the hominids, the family of humans, moved off in the other direction. The first genus of the hominids was not our genus. We're Homo sapiens. The Homo part is our genus. The first genus, the remains of which were discovered in Chad, Africa in 2002, is Sahelanthropus chadensis. Then we had Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, Kenyanthropus. Then our genus, Homo, showed up about a million and a half, two million years ago. It was our genus, but it wasn't our species. It was a species by the name of Homo rudifensis, the first in a line of Homo species. Homo rudifensis was followed by Homo habilis, Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, Homo antecessor, Homo neanderthalensis, and then 2004, on the island of Flores in Indonesia, the remains of a Homo species was discovered, a Homo species that was three feet tall, thought to be the only Homo species that may have coexisted with us. Homo floresiensis. Then we showed up, Homo sapiens, about 150,000 years ago. Homo sapiens stands for sensible humans. We showed up in Africa. We spread from Africa to Asia to Europe and the rest of the world. It's 150,000 years we've been here, we've mostly been Stone Age hunters and gatherers. The last 12,000 years, we've mostly been agrarians. A little over 200 years ago, very recently, in England, in the late 1700s, the Industrial Age began. By 1850, the Industrial Age spread from England to Belgium, Germany, France, the United States, and eventually to other industrialized countries. About 50 to 60 years ago, we transitioned from the Industrial Age to the post-industrial, high-tech, information age that we live in today, an age that allows us to disseminate information almost anywhere instantly. All this time, we're accumulating people. If we go back about 2,000 years, we had about 250 million people on this planet. We come out 500 years to the year 500 AD, no change. We still had about 250 million people on the planet. The year 1000 AD, we jumped up to about 500 million people. By 1500 AD, we're at 750 million people. At 1800, we hit our first billion. The industrial age kicks in. We start adding people more rapidly. From 1800 to 1900, we had 600 million people. At 1900, we're at 1.6 billion people. In 60 years, by 1960, we nearly doubled that. We're at 3 billion people. So at this point, we've been here about 150,000 years. We've accumulated 3 billion people. How long did it take for us to double that? 39 years. 39 years, 1999, we hit 6 billion people. By 2050, 42 years from now, projections are we'll have 9.2 billion people. Today, we have about 6.7 billion people. If we take a survey of a representative sample of the 6.7 billion people, take a survey of the attitudes, behavior, belief on any particular subject, plot the results of that survey on a graph, we typically get a curve that looks like this, commonly known as a bell curve. What does that mean? At the top of the range, the top of the curve, we have what's called the normal range of behavior, uh, the average behavior. Here, there's common ground, there's agreement. Then we have deviations. We've got one, two, three standard deviations to the right and extreme deviations. Then we have one, two, three standard deviations to the left and extreme deviations. What does that mean? It means that whatever the issue or the subject is, the people on this side of the curve have very different ideas than the people on this side of the curve. This results in opposition, conflict, and strife, up to including wars. This very predictable pattern contributes to life unpredictability, instability, and uncertainty. It's not the only thing that contributes to life's unpredictability, instability, and uncertainty. We've got the fickleness of nature. We have the extraordinary number of illnesses we contract and from which we suffer. We have countless accidents that occur with regularity. And then as a consequence of having so many people and not understanding our reality and the behavioral demands of our reality, we have created an interrelated web of life-threatening environmental problems. We're depleting our resources, our forestry, fisheries, rangelands, 
croplands, plant and animal species. We're destroying our biological diversity on which evolution thrives. The so-called sixth great extinction is going on right now. It's the first that's been caused by other than natural cause, like a meteorite hitting the planet. It's caused by us, humanity. With powerful electrical and diesel pumping techniques, we're draining our aquifers, we're lowering our water tables. We're systemically polluting our air, our water, our soil, and consequently our food chain. We're depleting our stratospheric ozone that protects us from harmful ultraviolet radiation. We're experiencing symptoms of global warming, heat waves, devastating droughts, dying forests, accelerated species destruction, destruction of coral reefs, melting glaciers, rising sea levels, more frequent and intense storms, more rapid spread of diseases. So life, so life is not guaranteed. It's up and down like a seesaw. And we're sitting on that seesaw. It's not an accident in the theater. For thousands of years, we've had for symbols the masks of comedy and tragedy, joy and sorrow. Life has always been like this. For answers, we've turned to science and religion, two diametrically opposite disciplines. Science is a very formal and rigid discipline that requires testing and retesting to arrive at its principles and theories. Any scientist, observer, or tester must get exactly the same results time after time wherever, wherever the test is made. The science is almost perverse in its methodology of testing. Yet science is very open and welcomes and celebrates changes when new discoveries are made. Religion, on the other hand, is an untested collection of dogmatic proposals, typically from supernatural sources and something we refer to as divine revelation. It's a phenomenon that came along when priests and priestesses invented themselves, which they continue to do today. Religion is not like change or challenges to its dogma. You change a few words of so-called revealed religions and religions unravel and splinter into smaller groups. These groups unravel and splinter into even smaller groups. Christianity, the religion in which I was raised, we know from a recent survey, has about 33,830 denominations. Evidence of religion, art, and recorded events goes back about 30, 40,000 years. There's been an estimated about 100,000 religions. Today, from the same survey, we know we have about 10,000 existing religions about 150 or so have a million or more followers. Some of the better known religions include Hinduism, started about 6,000 years ago, Judaism, 4,000 years ago, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, about 2,600 years ago, Christianity, 2,000 years ago, Islam, 1,400 years ago. Fred Allen, a comedian, once said, we sow wild oats six days a week. We get a little crazy six days a week. On the seventh, we pray to our religions for crop failure. We've worshipped everything from the sun to the moon, Egyptian pharaohs, Roman emperors. Then we started creating gods in our own image. We've created and worshipped many, many gods of many, many polytheistic religions. Then about 4,000 years ago in the Mideast, somebody came up with the idea that there's one God. It was just somebody's idea. It uh, could have been your idea my idea. This idea was the beginning of the Western concept of what we call monotheism. Mono means one, theism is God, one God. The religion was Judaism, the God Yahweh. About 1400 years later, on the other side of the world in the East, we had Buddhism begin in India, while at the same time in China, we had Taoism and Confucianism begin. These were major belief systems with no gods. Then about 2,000 years ago, in our first century, the New Testament Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John were created. When were these written? It's thought that they were written approximately in the year 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s of the first century, approximately 10 years apart, and long after the events that they were writing about were supposed to have occurred. Who wrote these books? No one knows. Uh, the Gospels were written by totally unknown anonymous writers. It's thought in the second century 
they were assigned the names of the Christian evangelist Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. What were these writers doing? Theologians agree that each of the writers had their own agenda and their own bias. What were they doing? Recall what Einstein said, we can't solve our problems from the same level of thinking from which they originated. The Jewish laws had been around for about 2,000 years. The people were trying to be more progressive, more inclusive, involve the Gentiles, help the poor, that sort of thing. To write their story, they picked up where the prophecy of the Old Testament left off and wrote a story to match that prophecy. And in doing so, and to embellish their story, they borrowed heavily from ancient themes of heroes and gods from pagan religions. Mithraism is a good example. At the time, it had been around about 700 years. It originated in Persia, which is now Iran. It was based on a fictional character by the name of Mithra. Mithraism was popular with the Roman soldiers and the civil servants, and a main competitor with Christianity for the first four centuries. The storyline of Mithraism was strikingly similar to Christianity. This is not really surprising because at the time there was no such thing as plagiarism. It was very common, in fact expected, to take elements of former stories and insert them into whatever story you were writing. So the storyline for Mithraism was strikingly similar to Christianity. Mithra was born of a virgin. At his birth were adoration of shepherds and magi kings. Kings were typically inserted into these stories to represent royalty to signify that a birth was important. Mithra's birth was on December 25th, the same day the Christians adopted. What's so special about December 25th, a date that was used in many stories at the time? December 25th is four days after the winter solstice, at which time became apparent to the ancients that the sun was rising again. Not only was it the sun, but the sun was worshiped as a god. This was an auspicious time to be born. The storyline for Mithraism contained miracle stories, resurrection, and ascension. The similarity in storylines made for easy conversion from Mithraism to Christianity. Out of all of this, a new story was created, and we ended up with a new god named Christ and a new religion called Christianity or Christianity. Where did this word Christ come from? Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which is an interpretation of the Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah or the anointed one as prophesied in the Old Testament. At some point, somewhere, somebody declared this story as contrived and plagiarized as it was to be the divinely inspired and infallible word of God. In other words, people were led to believe that the same gods they created in their stories were responsible for the stories they created. About 1400 years ago, in the leading city of Arabia, which was Mecca, Muhammad came along. Now he too heard the inerrant and infallible words of God. For 23 years, he made notes of what he heard. Actually, Muhammad didn't make notes because he couldn't write, but he had a scribe make notes. These notes were compiled into a book known as the Quran. The Quran, four-fifths the length of the New Testament, is considered by the Muslims as the final and infallible word of God. Out of this, a new religion formed called Islam which means peace and surrender or submission to God. And we ended up with a new God, Allah, which means literally the God, the one true God. Now we've given these gods great powers. We say they're omnipotent, that means they're all powerful. Omnipresent, they exist everywhere. Omniscient, have all knowledge and all learning. These stories have caused great worldwide confusion, conflict, suffering, and wars. 66% of our wars have been fought over these stories. We kill each other over these stories. It's the ultimate irony and a complete absurdity that we create these stories to establish examples of exemplary behavior and proper rules for living, and then we kill each other over these stories. One does not have to be a genius to conclude there's something absurd and fundamentally wrong here. We advance technologically easily, but not socially, politically, or intellectually. We continue to destroy each other in our environment. Why is that? We don't drive around vehicles that are thousands of years old. We don't see chariots running down the street. Yet, we cling to belief systems that are literally thousands of years old. 
As a consequence, many of us exist in a world of fiction and fantasy. We don't understand our reality and the behavioral demands of our reality. Instead of seeing the security that is found in our oneness, our togetherness, we create all kinds of divisions, all kinds of tribes. We have nation state tribes, political party tribes, religious tribes, corporate tribes, and on and on. The result is we exist not more secure, but less secure. In fact, we've created a destructive and unsustainable momentum that must be arrested and reversed if we're going to sustain humanity and advance our civilization.